Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Michael Wong. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. This is a, I've, I've been here a couple of times, and it never looks quite the same from stage here, so I'm going to try to have some fun with this. Today, um, we're going to talk about something that's my favorite topic. It's about the future of C++ and the fourth horseman of heterogeneous um, C++. Um, you're going to have some questions to why I invoke that kind of reference, and you're going to see um, a little bit later on. The usual disclaimers, um, much of this slide, I've collected from the work of numerous standard bodies, a lot of other talented people um, in, all, in C++, in Kronos, and in OpenMP. Um, so as a result, the confluence of many of their ideas, as well as the ideas from the, the research and the work that I've done over the years. So as a result, some, a lot of the things that's going on here, if there's still any errors, it's absolutely their fault. It's not mine, really. <laughs> Now, honestly, anything, anything that's left that is a mistake is absolutely my stupid mistake. <laughs> so the usual things that I'm going to talk about is the usual thing I'm going to add to the slide is usually what my company has me add. But let's skip to what the, the talk is going to be about. The talk is going, to be, is going to be about React Play. In the first act, I'm going to talk about what excites me. Then I'm going to talk about what are the horsemen of heterogeneous computing. And then whether we can do it in C++, in ISO C++, and implement it in Clang. So the first act, what gets me up every morning, and it's not just my cat, although he does a great job of getting me up, but what excites me is the idea that what it would mean to be able to access and fully control all the speed and power of your device. And about doing it across many, many devices, and then all in one high-level language. That's my dream. And I think about this all the time, because what we're dreaming about here is what it's like. It's like driving your car with all the cylinders firing, not just one. And maybe you might want to be able to drive it and be able to switch cars in the midway, because you might need more carrying capacity, or you might more speed, or you might need a self-driving car instead. Now, on this road, we're not exactly driving blind. Um, there are going to be road signs erected by others who's been there before. But they might be obliterated or blinded by some blizzard or the four horsemen. And we're going to see how we can get around that and understand what the problems are. So the goals are not easy, but it's worth doing. Because these are the things that gets me to get up every morning to go to work and then do it again the next morning, as well as a large number of other people doing it every day. So what this means to you, though, is that you can work to unleash your potential for the future of many devices, all in one language. So the talk is going to be about performance and portability and productivity, what I've been calling the Iron Triangle Parallel Programming Language Nirvana. Now, the reality of engineering is that you can't actually be able to optimize for all three. If you've been a team leader trying to do resource and features and timing, you're going to know what I mean. The best you probably can do is optimize for one or two of these things. And for that, we're going to try to aim for what's in the industry is generally called performance portability. Okay, so let's get started. So what's the problem? Why do we have, why do we need this? For a long time, we've been satisfied with merely accessing in standard C++ about one one thousand of the full speed of the machine. Okay. And you might have to drop down to some other language to get at the good stuff, the real true high speed that you can get at. And this is just an unfortunate state of affair in my mind. It's the danger, it has a danger of relegating C++ to some, maybe some driver language. And then, the, and then the real heavy lifting, the kernel computation might be done in some other vendor language or some intrinsics, for instance. So I'm going to put this in context of three periods of, of my life that I worked through, C++ 98, C++ 11, and C++ 17. Now, I worked through all that period of time helping to develop the C++ standard. And interestingly enough, I tend to always buy a new machine after every C++ standard wrap. I don't know why I do that. Maybe it's because I'm so exhausted, I need to get a new machine and play some games. But in 1998, I bought a typical machine. It had a single core, there was probably two threads in it, and it was capable of 0.45 gigaflops. And to program that, it was a Pentium 2. It did not have a SIMD unit, SSC came out a year later. It did not have a GPU, that also came out a year later. And it was just with the release of C++ 98, and C++ 98 was single threaded, 
It had an abstract machine, a flat addressing model, and it fitted that machine perfectly, almost perfectly. And if I look at other languages like C plus, like C99 or Fortran, they also fitted that machine for the most part fairly well. In 2011, I bought another machine, plus plus 11 went out. It was a, you know, had to work on the memory model and all that. And finally, I thought, you know what, I get a chance to play. I bought a machine that had now a, a core i7, actually had four cores, and it was capable, the CPU was capable of 80 gigaflops. And to program it, you would just use C++11. You could actually use OpenMP, you could use TBB, Silk, or OpenCL, to name a few. It had a vector unit, a simple unit, now comes with it, and it's, if you multiply it out, it comes out to about 140 gigaflops of AVX. And to program it, I pretty much have to drop out of C++ at that point. I would have to use like maybe OpenCL or, the, or the, some Intel intrinsics or CUDA, or maybe I have to have my compiler do auto vectorization. It came with, or at least I went and bought a 670 NVIDIA graphics card, the top of the line at the time, because I really wanted to play Call of Duty. And uh, <laughs> the only way I could program it was it, yeah, I had to use CUDA. I couldn't use OpenCL. I mean, sorry, I couldn't use C++. I could use OpenCL. I could use OpenGL. Um, it's a graphics chip, so I could use DirectX or some intrinsics. And at that time, there was also C++M. Now, fast forward to 2017. When C++17 was released, I once again upgraded my machine. And I bought a top-of-the-line NVIDIA 1080 graphics card because people at the, uh, the virtual reality headset told me that that's what I needed to, to make it work. So, okay. And but, so when I look at it, my CPU at that time was a little bit increased. It was about 140 gigaflops, not a big increase from 80. It's almost six years ago. And to program it, it uses great C++ 17 with all value references, move semantics, which gave me a bit of speed up in that tiny little yellow triangle there. And I, but by then, my programming system has pretty much started now, expanded out to many other things that's available. I could use SQL, for instance, to program the CPU. I could use OpenMP. I could use TBB, so CUDA, OpenCL. It also came with a SIMD unit, an AVX 512, with 560 gigaflops. And again, I could program it with the usual suspects like SQL, Intrinsics, OpenCL, CUDA, and OpenMP. OpenMP by then had added SIMD capabilities, thanks to a number of folks across the committee, especially from Intel. And to program the GPU, this incredible 1080 graphics card, I couldn't use C++17, but that's okay. Because now I don't need to, because now I have SQL, CUDA, OpenCL, OpenGL, DirectX, Intrinsics, and OpenMP that could help me do that. Stepping back for a moment, I would say that, in fact, seeing all this proliferation of C++ frameworks that allows me to program the whole machine, I would say that the Big Bang of C++ heterogeneous programming has already occurred. Where there was just a few, now there are many. The training wheels really have come off of these languages. We're not just figuring how to do it, we're now figuring out when to do it and how to do it best so that we can defeat enforcements. So that we can do it ultimately in a performant, portable manner, which, is, which I call the next nirvana. Now some of the frameworks are runtimes, um, other than the usual suspects I already talked about, like OpenCL, OpenMP, SQL, CUDA, which are fairly full compilation systems. Other frameworks are more runtime systems, like Cocos and Rajas. Then you also have a boost library that could do it with. You could use boost.compute, for instance. And some people are even more ambitious. They might want to solve a bigger problem, like distributed computing, almost a, almost a superset of heterogeneous computing. And they might use HPX. So I would say that the time is now. We've done enough of these that we know how to do it well, reasonably well, and it's time to add to ISO C++. If we have multi-core CPU parallelism, why do we not have heterogeneous capability support, or maybe even distributed in C++, in ISO C++? Well, because it's not easy. It's not impossible, but it's not that simple. We're gonna talk about these challenges. And as time goes by, today we have many diverse ways of programming all these different devices, these accelerator devices that are appearing everywhere in your phone, in your self-driving cars. And every time you do this, you may have to drop down to some other intrinsic or some proprietary language. We don't want to do that. 
because it ultimately it could compromise type safety and you can lose optimizations going that way. So we also want to be able to readily be able to support multiple devices today and in the future. So if you look at it, you're gonna see that today we have these discrete GPUs, but you also have these integrated APUs. Um, we have accelerated devices, accelerated devices that are essentially DSPs or FPGAs and, AP and, and things like that. But in some cases, in many cases, they all will have different ABIs. And in some cases, the ABI may not even be known until years later. So here are a number of new boards that are appearing at Hot Chips um, that was just here in San Jose a couple of months ago. And many of them seems to be focused on one thing, and that's adding into it machine learning hardware. And they made, in these kinds of hardware, and I'm showing here an ARM ML processor, one from Xilinx, one from Google, okay, and one from NVIDIA, and I can't remember the last two are. But in some of these things, when I look at it, they might have many different uh, kinds of CPU on that same board. They might have different kinds of accelerator units that are like machine learning accelerator units or vision processing units. They have a GPU, a DSP, an FPGA, or one of these things called coarse grain um, configura reconfigurable array, which is where that AI engine array is in the Xilinx process, in the Xilinx boards. They have different power options, they have lots of IOs, and they have various on-chip memory. Ultimately, this is now the new modern systems on a chip, multi-processor SOCs. So our heterogeneous programming language has to adapt to these, evolve this domain as it, as it come out. And C++, for it to grow, and for the compilation, the Clang adoption to grow with it, I was urged that we need to learn from this and adapt to it because I, by, by doing things like updating our compilation process. The lucky thing is it's not that far away because there are industries out there that have shown us the way. So while I was, some of you guys have known that I was used to be an OpenFP doing a lot of high performance computing. And when I was there, I pretty much came from a monolithic compilation um, path. Well, I do, I fully control the front end or the back end, or, and the back end maybe in some cases, or I can communicate the ABI um, easily between the host and device relatively like using the NVCC tool chain. The thing is, we now also live in a world with compilation where you have compilation of the host by one compiler and the device by a different compiler. There are other cases where the device compiler may not even uh, go through the IR, but direct to ISA. Some people might even use several different host compilers. And in fact, different processors may even come with multiple different tool chains. More importantly, the separate host and device compilation model may be separated by many years, which is the reality of what we deal with often at Codeplay. Especially, so in other words, I don't fully control the compilation tool chain, which is especially true for self-driving cars. I may not have the freedom to customize, to extend or modify it to interoperate with each of the other tools. So this is common when you're building out embedded AI devices um, for things like self-driving car, or if you like, maybe a personal reality distortion field, whatever, you, whatever makes you happy. Now, because you think that this is, now you might, before you might you think that this is strange, the reality is that this is a situation in graphics for many years. Now, graphics vendors, shaders are built at runtime whenever the game is, is playing. And different graphics vendors tool chains produce the final binary that's gonna be executed on their hardware. When you watch, your, when you switch your GPUs years later, the shaders in your game, which might be quite old, um, will be recompiled with, 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 with a brand new tool chain. No one in that industry is surprised by this. I see a lot of nods in the, head, in the audience, so I think I'm, I'm speaking to people who knows what's going on here. Now, Remember, we're still talking about single source for host and device. And after some early attempts with heterogeneous programming with separate source between the host and the device, we now know that for C++, that's the only way to go. It's the right way to go because it would guarantee type safety across host and device. Single source have other benefits like giving programmer more productivity. So you don't have to copy boilerplate coding back and forth between host and device. It's also allows you to do um, um, compile time evaluation of the device code, which allows you to do now C++ generic programming. So at Codeplay, they had this uh, single source standard C++ offload for the PS3, for instance, that was used in AAA games like NASCAR 2011. And it became the predecessor, predecessor for ComputeCTT, which is the SQL implementation, 
Okay, that's why we know a little bit about where this is going. Now with the device compiler, it can even be sitting on top of other C++ tool chains. This is nice because now you can, uh, programmers often don't want to um, change their favorite C++ compiler, which is an important consideration. And in some businesses, it might be impossible for performance or business reasons to actually change the, still, the host compiler. So we would like this flexibility of being able to have the device compiler sit on various tool chains like Clang or GCC or XLC or, or Visual C++ or EDG compilers. So there is a need for stable IR so vendors can generate code for a device that might, they might not know for years. The consumer in this case is the accelerator of the device, so the device authors who use LLVM but with a known version. And the producer of the code, of the host code, also use a known version of LLVMs. And in this way, SPIR-V, which, which can act as an interchange format from Kronos, can, act, can do this job. So now there is an effort from the Kronos group to interact with, on the ecosystem led by Anastasia, Anastasia Stutlova to coordinate opportunities between Spear V and LLVM. And I highly recommend that you take, close, take a close look at that. Ultimately, the goal there, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, is to support Spear V as a supported client backend. Now, the ABI, ABI issue eventually is going to be a problem. But right now, for good reason, C++ ABIs have a few places where it makes it hard to communicate if you have a separate uh, host device compilation like the Lambda format is not a standard layout type and things like that. So there's hope that at some point, a reflection facility would help solve that problem. But ultimately, all this is gonna get us closer to the portability that we've been asking for. So I'm gonna to move to act two and ask the question, what are the four horsemen of heterogeneous computing? So how do we do it? And what are the problems that are along this road? If we want one language in modern C++, then we have to take from the existing C++ frameworks that are already doing that. And there are many of them, like Cocos, HPX, Raja, or they might be complete tool chains like Seco and CUDA. Okay, notice I've separated out OpenCL now because OpenCL is still C for the most part. There is an OpenCL C++, but I won't dive into that too much. Um, so keep in mind that we're beyond just trying to make things work. We want it to work with portable performance. So assuming we want to keep that goal and that it is now done in standard C++, then we can take a look at what all these frameworks have demonstrated. And not surprisingly, after I studied all of them and looked at them, they all solve a piece of the problem. And in some cases, the problem, they might solve the same problem in similar ways. So it turns out that to maintain performance portability, you usually have to deal with the four horsemen, Coco's Christian Schrott, and now NVIDIA's Carter Edwards, as well as HPX Harvard Kaiser agrees with me. And after working with, into, on integrating several GPU programming languages um, into mainstream engines, mainstream languages, uh, starting with IBM's cell processor, and then OpenMP's accelerators, and then now Kronos Sickle and OpenCL, and then, through, and then driving it into ISO C++, it's fairly clear to me that these are the prevailing problems of our age. These are the usual challenges for performance portability, and they're the, what I call the four horsemen of heterogeneous computing. You have data movement, you have data layout, you have data affinity, and ultimately you have data locality. It's truly, it's about, it's like that real estate mantra. It's about location, location, location. So data movement is all about, a little bit also about power consumption, how much power it takes to move data across. And ultimately, this is all about what it costs to move data from your CPU, your low latency device, to your high throughput GPU device, okay? And whether it's worth it or not. Usually, it can be separated out into two parts. Um, there's this idea called implicit data movement and explicit data movement. Now, most of the languages um, that you're familiar with uses what's called explicit data movement. And that's OpenCL, CUDA, and OpenMP. Would they move to the device via an explicit copy API? There are two languages that actually use implicit data movement, and that's SQL and C++M. Where data is built using a call graph dependency chain and then the runtime acts to move the data to the execution agent on the GPU just in time. What it does is it gives you an ability to minimize 
minimize the amount of movement. Okay, but that's not, that's not really the that's it's not just all about advantages and disadvantages of these two. They both have their own. After some examinations, it turns out that what you really need is actually both. If you're working on a runtime, you probably need more explicit data movements to control exactly where you want to move things. If you're working on a much higher level language and you want to absorb the user from having to think about moving data precisely at certain points and not knowing whether something's copied an odd number of times and you only have to um, do, it, do, do it and if it's only an odd number of times and not an even number of times, for instance, then you might want something that's more like implicit data movement. Okay. Now, in some cases, it turns out, especially if you, if you can control the whole compile chain and you can see the whole program, you could abstract out or what the data movement is in simple cases, but not in all cases. The next horseman is what's called data layout. Okay? Data layout involves having your own type for storage that's suitable for the CPU and the GPU, which they, and they all demand slightly different treatments. So this is now already a proposal from Cocos called MDSpan that's working its way through the C++ committee. Okay? And what it's going to give you, the, the great thing about this proposal is going to give you, finally, a true C++ array or matrix. Okay? And on top of that, you can now build things like, like linear algebra libraries and eigen libraries. The, key, the beautiful thing with MDSpan is that it uses a view that effectively enables you to have this conventional array and with whatever appropriate storage you might want. Okay? And, they might give, and it also gives you it's so a storage pattern, the right storage pattern for your CPU and GPU. What is a storage pattern? It's because CPUs generally want contiguous storage for caching, for, for caching effects, whereas GPUs want strided access, which then has to be coalesced. Okay? So what happens is that this enables essentially a platform agnostic pattern that gives you basic functional array and, and matrix. At some point, you might even be able to straddle your data, data structure across CPU and GPU. Now, both Sicko and Cocos are also supporting the idea of data mapping, execution space, ex memory space, AOS versus SOA's transformation. So it's not surprising that this is an example of how these languages are solving similar problems. The next problem that I want to talk about is data affinity. Now, data affinity defines where agents and memories is required to be near or far. And it's important as the next important piece of the puzzle. Some agents prefer some memory as default. And the proposal is from Codeplay, and it's working its way through the committee. It proposes both a low granularity and a high granularity interface. So a high granularity interface is some is would enable people who are building runtimes to be able to exactly drill down, maybe using HW log, to see the entire hierarchy of the processors, the cache systems, okay, and manipulate them precisely as needed. When we presented it, people from Coco said, you know, we actually need that. Now, other parts, other members of the committee, rightly so, argue strongly for a low granularity, or granularity, or what I call a high-level interface. So that you all you might want to say is, I want this data to be near this execution agent. I don't care when, I don't care how, just make that happen. And that's more ideal with the kind of C++ abstraction. When we presented this to the, to the SG1 chair, that's exactly the kind of things that he was asking for. I think I met Olivier this morning, so I know he's here somewhere. Thank you. <laughs> In a way, everything we have been talking about is related to data locality. But there will be a deeper question we're going to need to answer. Would all these changes, and then with executors ultimately mediating the dispatching of functions to accelerate the resources, the question is, will we still need to adjust C++ to the hetero, to the kind of typical hierarchical data layout uh, that's common in GPU architectures? So that if you have different address spaces, or you might have different coherence, will you still be able to, using these um, these proposals gain the ultimate speed that is typical in a lower level language. That question in my mind remains unanswered. So let's move to Act 3. How can we do it? And I, I talked about some of the challenges. I talked about motivation of why we want to do it. Question is, can we do it in ISO C++ and can we do it in Clang? And I'm sure it's a rhetorical question, so you know the answer. 
So can we do it in one ISO C++ language? How hard is it? And is it even on the, on the radar? Well, yes. In February of this year, um, that we created something called the C++ Directions Group. And they issue a directions, a document, and most interestingly on that document, it indicates a future that covers heterogeneous computing. And that's great news. So let me tell you a bit of a secret about working on the C++ Standard Committee. Okay. You see, C++ Standard Development is a bit like Brownian motion. Actually, it's more like a Ouija board with many hands pulling and tugging, sometimes cooperatively, sometimes not, so that you never actually really know where the puck is going to land. That's a little bit of an extreme, but some of you guys are going to recognize and understand what that actually means. So we, and I'm a member of the DG group, see C++, because of that, in danger of losing coherency. Because there are proposals that are based on different and sometimes mutually contradictory designs, design ideas, philosophy, or stylistic cases. So switching my hat now to being a DG member, not just a Coldplay person or a keynote speaker here, I'm going to say that the DG members are concerned with both the long-term and the short-term direction of C++ and the handling of proposals, especially where they might interact with multiple working groups. And there are now five with the potential of increasing to maybe about 10 in the next couple of iterations. When we're looking at direction and at ind individual papers, we're going to try to consider the interests of the C++, of the larger C++ community as a whole, rather than just a narrow interest of a few WG21 members. That's a good thing for C++. So what's the direction group? It's a group that was started um, in 2017, although the idea came from real needs. We're basically an invitation-only group chosen, we think, um, for our decades of C++ standard experience, and maybe we've demonstrated a modicum of, of, of fairness and impartiality when we look at different proposals, even if our own is competing with them. So assuming we succeed, many of us, many of us are going to be writing C++ for 10, maybe 20 years. And what kind of aims should we be, be reasonable for that kind of time frame? Obviously, long-term aims basically cannot change every year. There's one thing that we keep, we keep coming back to, and that is that C++ relies critically on static type safety for expressiveness, for performance, and for, safe, for, for doing safe things. So this is the ideal that we want to follow. There are two pillars, and it's worth repeating them. That we want to have better support for modern hardware, and that includes CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, newer architectures, distributed systems, and the new memory systems like high bandwidth memory. We want more expressive and simpler and safer abstractions mechanisms. So C++ covers a lot of domains, and we don't specifically want to recommend any specific domains. These are just examples, okay? And they cover things like safety, security, simplification, interoperabilities, such as the standard layout type that allows you to exchange data. This is going to become pretty important when you start moving into machine learning. We want to support demanding applications like medical, finance, automotive, and games. And embedded systems is taking on a brand new light of, being, of importance because so many of the chips that we're designing now are essentially small embedded devices that has the power of a supercomputer inside them. There are other, we also need alternatives for error-prone and unsafe facilities. So we, need, we definitely need better tools. Um, we need better software development tools. This is why I want to bring this message to this crowd specifically. We need better tools for C++, like compilers, static analyzers, refactoring tools, significantly improved. What we can do on the committee is do not complicate it by increasing compile time, aka hopefully modules comes in, and don't add complexity barriers, like having use of macros in, the, in, a, in a design or brittle spinet, spinet for instance. That compl those things generally complicate tools. The last thing that I picked out of that document that I want to tell you about is that about the C++ standard direction, is that here are some concrete suggestions to support our long-term goals. Things like pattern matching, which I know there's going to be a talk about, exception and error returns, static reflection, Modern networking, there's a networking proposal that hopefully we can drive in if um, executor works with it. And I think, I think it will, but let's see how that goes. 
It also adds modern hardware and simple graphics and interactions. Now, on modern hardware, the key thing there is the statement that says, we need better support for modern hardware, such as executors, execution contacts, and affinity, leading ultimately to heterogeneous and distributed computing support. So there you have it. A clear direction towards heterogeneous distributed C++ for ISO C++ future. Now, stepping back for a moment, um, just like C++ is the standard, and we have many implementations like Clang, or the EDG compiler, or GCC, or Visual C++, or the Excel compiler that I used to work on, SICL is really a, a standard, a language standard from Kronos. And there are several implementations as well. It's Compute CPP from Codeplay. Xilinx, um, Renan Cariel has something called Tricycle, which is an open source implementation, whereas ours is both commercial and open. There's a free download. So his is an open source implementation. And now there's um, Hipsicle from um, a research uh, graduate student that is trying to drive support for AMD and Intel devices. And it's also, I think it's also open source. So just to show you that we do use Clang, we, uh, the company actually, our company actually upgrade upstreams a lot of Clang uh, contributions, but not this particular one, but you might ask, so do we really know what we're talking about? Yes, we do. We use Clang for the front end, for the back end. We have the input file that's checked on the SEMA for correctness. The AST is outlined, what we call duplication, following the address space inference rules. And then the LLVM IR is generated alongside the stub metadata file. The LLVM takes this IR and validates it against the SQL programming rules. And then it's passed to the back end. And by default right now, we use Spear, but other people, others can be used like PTX, for instance, if we want to go directly to IS. The binaries is added as part of the integration header. So all this works in a multi-compilation pass, single, single source manner that I've been describing about. That's why, and then the other one is Tricycle, which is a device which actually also uses Clang LLVM in much of its infrastructure, but also use OpenMP. It gives you an experimental platform to implement many of the SICL ideas. And both Tricycle and and Compute CPP from my company has been has converted TensorFlow to, to the SQL programming language so that it can actually demonstrate its use with a massive C++ code base that's using massive amounts of templates and modern C++ programming. And the reason we have to do that is because TensorFlow is originally written only for CUDA. So if you want something that allows you to easily switch to multiple devices, SQL was the way to get us, get us there. And we can demonstrate the results with, um, with Intel, ARM, and AMD devices running TensorFlow. And I've given some talks at machine learning conferences about that. Finally, one more thing. It's worth demonstrating the power of using all the speed up in your machine. CodePlays has actually built C++ 17 parallel STL. And we make it work not just for CPU, which is all that's required by the C++ standard, but it also works for GPU using SICL. So let's see what we can do with parallel STL on a GPU using a SICL execution policy. My colleague, Gordon Brown, is going to demonstrate that. But to give you an idea what this means is that if you're familiar with C++ 17 parallel STL, it's probably one of the biggest benefits you can get out of C++ 17. In addition of maybe one keyword, you can probably get something like 30% speed up in your STL algorithms. So here, I'm only um, using one core. This is C++ um, um, STL algorithm for fill in without any, any, any extra speed up. That's not very satisfying, but if I start using um, something at, like adding execution policy par on it, now my workload is distributed across cores. You can see the benefit of that. Now for the first time, C++ 17 can actually allow us to use multiple cores of the CPU, but still nothing on the CMD, which is the next section under, and nothing on the GPU. So how do we do that? Well, we bring in SICL and add something called SICL execute policy. It's allowed in the C++ standard because there's this escape clause that allows you to add a vendor policy. And you can name it whatever you want. Um, so we named it SICL policy. And with that, it allows you to distribute work across GPU cores for this, this C++ standard fill-in algorithm. We've gone even further. What if you want to distribute and load balance across all your CPU cores or your, and your GPU cores, you can have this extra policy called header policy, about load balancing of 0.5 between CPU and GPU, 
okay, for this particular execution. So how does this look? Let's see if this works. I'm going to give a demonstration, but not me. I'm actually going to just uh, just do it on. Oops, it disappeared. How did that happen? Thank you. You came back. Okay. My name is my name is Michael Wong. Um, um, among other things, I'm the concurrency technical specification editor. As well so as I'm not going to run this whole video. I'm actually going to move to um, a particular area. Um, this, is another, this is not where, just any other. Ah, down there. That's where it is. To run the standard template library algorithms in parallel, we're going to show you how the overhead of moving data to your GPU and back again um, is is quite high. So if you if the, the the amount of work that you're executing across doesn't is it enough to outweigh the, the overhead of, of moving data, then it's, it's often not, not worth it. Uh, but if we, if we go back here and switch to a higher... So Gordon is going to switch to a much bigger workload so it doesn't swamp, so it gives you benefits of actually moving all that data to the GPU. He demonstrated that with a small workload, the GPU doesn't give you very much benefits. Now I'm going to run it across the, the normal C++ 17 execution policy so same, so of unseek, of parallel, and parallel vector, and then he's going to do it again for the sickle policy. Similar results from the, the three standard policies, so 1.8, 1.7, 1.6. So the, the unsequence is, is, is still faster. However, the, the sickle policy is, is running approximately four or five times faster than the, the standard policy on the CPU. So this shows you, you, you can get a, a, a lot of speed up by running. I'm going to stop there. Now, isn't that amazing? We're not talking about a couple of percentage, we're talking about four or five times more speed up. And until I show something like this, people don't really grog what it means to have this full capability, this full speed up, this full power under your hand. And I highlighted that he had to move the number of data size to 2 to the 19 before he ultimately was finally able to get that speed up. In the other cases, um, the overhead moving things to the GPU was simply not is so significant that you can see that in the SQL execution policy, it didn't buy you a whole lot. And only in the last column, you see that it suddenly jumped to about four to five times what the CPU execution policies was able to give you. I think this is significant. And this is the kind of things that excites me. A unified C++ heterogeneous programming model where I don't have to drop out of my favorite C++ language to get at the good stuff across all the, all the devices on my machine with many, many devices, including future devices like tensor, process, like tensor processing units. It's something I call a bit like the quiet revolution. I call it quiet revolution because you are never going to see an ex you're not going to see at least not yet an explicit heterogeneous technical specification or a study group. But believe me when I say that a lot of people on the committee is committed to this priority. Okay, even though they, it looks like we're working on the CPU proposals for executors, for affinity, for maybe I don't know pipelines. A lot of these people are keeping in mind keep the door open. For and accelerators and other kinds of fancy um, hardware devices. I hope that one day I can access all the speed ups of my machine, of my system, of my handheld, of my self driving car, by just with the ease of just adding a single execution policy. I can maybe minimize the data movement with a single uh, trade or property. I can set the data layout. I can use the correct affinity, or maybe by default for CPU or GPU, or just satisfying the CPUs or the GPUs preferred locality. That's how I'm gonna defeat the four horsemen. Ultimately, I think this is vast growth potential in the fields of medicine, learning, machine learning, low latency, and increasing the use of these embedded devices that are now appearing everywhere for all the things that we want to do. Thank you very much.
Okay. We have time. We'll go over a little bit. I have time for a few questions if anybody has any. Just raise your hand. We'll try to get the mic to you. There's also a mic in the middle here. Any questions? Dead. Mostly. Oh, okay. So uh, on the Hasco ecosystem, there is a lot of uh, Hasco. Like prior art on dynamically deciding execution policy, like from a single CPU to multiple CPUs. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And if I uh, understand correctly, a, a lot of it is with, it depends on the introspection of the code on how, how the compiler estimates right. the cost is gonna, yeah. of the execution is gonna be. Do you think there is a space for uh, the compiler to be able to predict what the cost of the code versus the cost, cost of moving the data? Yeah, so and you said the, so you're talking about the idea that um, be able to dynamically update the policy and that's something I firmly believe we need. But C++ tends to take tiny steps. And all these policies are the tiny steps that we hope to get there. And one hope is that with a sufficiently powerful reflection policy, and I know reflection isn't stopping with this, this the chair as well, um, we can be able to look at C++ in that way, it's introspection, for instance, so that we can support that. All that is probably stage two. Maybe not stage one. But, and I'm not totally familiar with Haskell, but I will take a look at it. But that is some dream of a lot of people here to be able to dynamically um, change the policy in the future. Now, C++, parallel, okay, parallelism, it, it had a dynamic execution policy that you could change, but it got tripped out at the last moment because we couldn't really be sure about what we want to do in the future and whether it was going to cost you to keep state. So yes, there's definitely intention. Right now, it's a fairly static execution policy, but it will it will it will come back. Yeah. Thank you for the great talk. Thank you. I have a question on usability. Usability, so yeah. It seems to be that supporting portability itself is a great improvement mm -hmm. of usability. What other aspects of usability are you uh, referring to, and can you just expand a bit on on the trade-offs between that and let's say performance? Right. Um, I always go back to my, so the question is about usability trade-offs with portability and how it affects performance. I always go back to my um, uh, Iron Triangle or parallel programming design. This is something that's taught by um, my mentor, Paul McKinney, when I was still working at IBM. And the thing there is that I find um, if you have great portability, um, you're going to somehow, and you still want performance, you might lose out on productivity. Okay. And that's, that's a, that's a trade-off, as an engineering trade-off. It's not anything that weird in our mind. It's, it's just normal, okay? Um, if you have great usability, you might say that that's part of productivity, okay? I want high productivity. But then what's going to happen is I might lose on portability or performance, but not necessarily both. So one of the great, most usable, usable sorry, parallel programming languages out there, probably what I would call the most successful parallel programming language. Does anyone know what that is? That is? Is it OpenMP? Is it OpenCL? Is it C++? It's none of those. It's actually SQL. It's one of the most born and usable, productive parallel programming languages. Just think about it. Without any training in parallelism, get lock breaks conditions, millions of pe people are able to make use of an SQL database, accessing tremendous amount of data in parallel. That's usability. But SQL isn't particularly high performance, okay? But it is getting there. And it's, so there's some limitations there, okay, because of this uh, tremendous uh, po um, productivity um, that you, you get out of it, okay. And I would argue that you would absolutely need a killer application um, that demonstrates this high productivity for um, the next successful parallel programming language. And that might be machine learning and self-driving cars. We've been searching for that kind of killer application for a long time, and maybe one has arrived, okay. Great. Thank you, Michael. Uh, let's thank him one more time. And if you have more questions, talk to him after. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. We now have a break.